Hello and welcome back to Uroro Niwa. My name is Mike Charlton. And if you remember last time, we just got out of the bowels of the depths of the earth. And we have an adventurer whose name is Adil Zubantheban, which I think is an amazing name, actually. I, I forget, I think it's Banner Hushed is her real name. And I think if we look at our statistics, it will tell us. Now, one of the things which we haven't done so far is we haven't really looked at Adil. So I'm going to actually press Z. And Z actually brings you to a screen that tells you how your your character is doing so far. And you'll see on the left hand side that we have we have some skills. These are the skills that we started with when we built the character. And we have novice axe dwarf, novice shield user, and so on. You'll see as well that they're all brown. And what that means is that as we get experience to go to the next level, for instance, to go from a novice to adept, it will turn green. And you'll see here, I have two things. Uh, one which is novice swimmer, the other is competent tracker. Um, and they have had some improvement. One of them I will explain a little bit, which is uh, the novice swimmer has improved a little bit because I actually went swimming in the uh, water in the caverns while you weren't watching. Uh, actually, I cut that out of the video because it was a bit boring and I will show swimming another time. Competent Tracker, this has improved for no reason that I actually know about. So this is actually kind of interesting that this is because I haven't turned on tracking at all. Next, in the center column, you can see these are needs that your character has. If you've played other kinds of roguelike games, you, this may be a kind of a strange idea, but you, all of the characters, all of the dwarves, all of the animals even in the world have needs. And this happens to be the needs that Adil Zulbantabam has. And you can see she, she has need to socialize, stay occupied. Now some of these she needs, she has a great need for and some of them she has less. And if you remember previously, we kind of adjusted those in the advanced settings when creating the character. You will see that she's undistracted for most of these, which means that it's basically, she's okay with it, she hasn't done anything in particular to, to improve the situation, but it's not bothering her at all. So we haven't done a lot of these things, we haven't fought her or anything, but she doesn't worry about that because she doesn't really care about fighting. Uh, but you will notice as well that some of these are green, and that means that she's feeling good about that, or she's feeling unfettered. And so she socialized a bit, and that happened when we talked to people. We asked about things, as well, so we learned something, and she felt unfettered by learning something, and we practiced a skill. Again, you'll see on the right-hand side, this is her current status in terms of injuries. We can also view our attributes, which if I press S, you'll see at the bottom. Uh, I'll press S, and you can see these are the attributes that we invested in when we first started. If I press S again, it goes back to the previous one. If I press H, this is the health screen, and actually this is the same health screen that's in the fortress mode. Now this will not get filled in generally for an adventurer because you need a doctor to actually fill in most of this stuff. Adventurers can't really be treated by doctors currently in the game. Like everything in the game, or most things in the game, the treatment of wounds and things for adventurers is unfinished. The developer of the game, Tarn Adams, also known as Toady1, has said that he wants to do something about this but just hasn't gotten around to it yet. So it may be a few years before he gets to it. If I press K, it tells you the number of kills, but right at the moment it's not highlighted and if I press K it does nothing because we haven't killed anything. And then we can look at our description. This is the same description we had before. And finally, on why we have customization. This is actually very useful. This is uh, you can do this on adventurers. You can do it on any creature you meet, actually. You can customize them so you can remember them better. You can do it with your dwarves in Dwarf Fortress as well, and I highly recommend it. It's a good idea. In this particular case, Adil Zulbanthabam is marked as an axe dwarf because she's a guard in the fortress. She is marked as an axe dwarf, but we actually don't want her to be an axe dwarf. We want her to be a journalist. So I can actually change her profession name to by pressing P, and I can put anything I want in here. So if I then say journalist, see me, I know how to spell it. There we go, now she's a journalist. And you could put anything you want here, and this is very, very useful in 
uh, fortress mode because you can group your dwarves based on the type of work that they do and you don't have to to follow the kind of automated assignment of profession that the game provides. The next thing is you can provide a nickname and I actually recommend that you set a nickname on all of your dwarves. It makes it much easier to identify them when you are looking in legends mode or if you happen to meet them. So for instance, if we start a fortress, Adel may actually join our fortress, it's possible. Right? And so it would be nice to know that this is the Adel Zilbantabam that we've been playing as an adventurer and not just somebody with the same name. So we can do that by setting a nickname. In a lot of the Let's Play games, there's a bit of a tradition of allowing people to uh, give nicknames to the characters of the game. What we can do then is, if you have a good idea for a nickname for Adel at the end of this episode, please put it in the comments and I will pick the most interesting one. I don't want to do exactly the same as what other people have done, which is to say, uh, give this idea that, you know, you are playing, that you are that character. But what I want to do is to come up with kind of interesting names and fun names for them. And I'll just pick, I'll just pick the one that strikes my fancy the most. Now, having said all of that, let's get on our adventure. One of the things, we're now in a tavern and it would be nice to actually have a drink and whatnot, but I don't think we'll be able to do that but one of the things I like to do in a tavern is to do performances. So, and we're a journalist, so I think what we're going to do is we're going to actually tell a story. I'll press K. This will begin a performance. If we press enter now, begin a performance. And then it'll ask us what kind of performance that we want to do. So we can tell a story, we can recite poetry, we can perform music, or we can dance. Now, you can't actually do all of these things if you don't have the ability to do it or if you don't have the knowledge to do it. So for instance, like, and it's plus and minus to scroll. So if I hit dance, for instance, I don't know any dance. Oh, I do actually, apparently no dances. I, I didn't realize this. Well, let's do a dance. One of the things about doing a dance, you have to have enough space to do a dance. Here we see, um, this is a, a dance called And She Sang Home. It, it's an example of the wispy petals. All right, and then it tells a little bit about how good this is, it says, this work has no particular subject, but overall the chor choreography is masterful. And then it gives you a little bit of information about where the dance came from and that kind of thing. It, it will also talk about what kind of music will go along with it. So here we say the Wispy Petals is a solo performance dance originating from the Coast of Forever. If you remember correctly, the Coast of Forever is I, th I hope I remember correctly, but I'm pretty sure the Coast of Forever is the Elvish civilization. In fact, we can check that now that I fixed the blue flashes. I, I hope, anyway, you will not see blue flashes. I did actually finally figure out what was going on with the blue flashes. Here I've got, again, we have the Dwarf Fortress directory. And what are we looking for? We're looking for the coast of forever. There we go. The coast of forever are elves. They have many druids. Not very interesting, but there we go. This is a, so this is an elvish dance. The dance is accompanied by the wisp of chance. So the wisp of chance is music. So let's see if there's any dances from other civilizations. It must have been shovel. Again, an example of the wispy petal from the coast of forever. The birth of hound is another example of the wispy petal. I guess we we must really like the wispy petal, because um, these are the only dances we know. Again, the erased ram. The erased ram is again an example of the wispy petal. Saturnine luxuries is a sacred group dance originating from the exalted shield. It's accompanied by any composition of the flowery silknesses. And again, this flowery silknesses will be some music. The dancers perform a double circle moving to the music's artrid rhythm. I don't know what artrid rhythm means, but this dance has a refined art form with five specific moves to be mastered. I'm almost tempted to do that, although we only have one person in the room to do this dance with us. So given that you're supposed to have a double circle, I'm not quite sure how we're going to manage that. And then we have again, we see Jester, which is another example of the wispy pedal. I think we're going to go ahead and do the erased ram 
even though it's wispy pedal it seems that we really like the wispy pedal so we just press return put the erased ram and oh there's not enough room to perform here so let's try again okay we'll do a performance we'll just go straight into telling a story when you tell a story you can tell a story about many different things but you can only tell stories about things you actually know about. One of the things I want to do is, let's say we want to tell a story. Ideally, at some point, we want to talk, start talking about Zon Prestige Papers. And what you can see here is that when we ask about a person, it will only talk about people that we know about. What we really wanted to do is we want to tell a story about Zon Prestige Papers, but we don't know Zon Prestige Papers, so we can't tell a story about it. All right, begin, tell a story. Let's say I wanted to talk about a site. Again, now this tells me about all the sites I know about. I wonder if we know about pulley routers. So again, if I press F for filter, and we do actually know about pulley routers. So if I plus, plus, plus down to pulley routers, I wonder if we can tell a story about. We can. So we can actually tell a little bit about pulley routers because we actually know something about pulley routers. I'm going to talk about the return of Zon Prestige Papers in the early spring. So even though we don't know anything about Zon Prestige Papers, apparently since we know about pulley routers, we can tell a story about Zon Prestige Papers. So you'll see here at the bottom on the left hand side, it says performing occupied. And what you want to do at this point is you want to wait. Now there are two keys for waiting. One is dot. Uh, just a period and the other is comma and what comma does is it waits until the next action that's normally actually what you want it's a little bit unusual dot waits for a specific amount of time but generally speaking you actually want to use comma it's much more refined i'm going to use comma to to wait and you'll see that people are moving around a bit uh, there are a lot of people on the screen and my machine is not very fast but you'll see here We've started our story and it says you begin the story of the return of Zon Prestige Papers to Pulley Rooters in the early spring of 15. Now unfortunately it's going to take a long time to tell this story and we're not going to get any more details which is unfortunate. That says we can be free to act or press dot to continue so we want to press dot to continue the story. So we just press dot. But I'm stumbling over the details because I'm not a good storyteller yet. And I'm stumbling over the details. And this is apparently a very long story. <laughs> and in fact, the, the tavern keeper is getting bored and walking away. All right, and I've concluded my performance. I press K here and I talk to the tavern keeper and we greet him. We probably should have greeted him before. That says the tavern keeper says, hey, it's good to see you because he knows me. We're friends. And this is the Saffron of Harvester. That's the name of the, the tavern. Do you have a story to tell? And he knows that we tell stories because we just told a story. He says, traveling alone in the wilds, you know better than that. And the reason he's saying that is because traveling alone in the wilds is incredibly dangerous. It's really incredibly dangerous. And if you've played adventure mode before, you have almost certainly died many times traveling alone in the wilds. So it's something that you do not want to do. And I won't really get into why you don't want to do it because maybe someday you can do it yourself and then you can die and you'll know why. <laughs> you don't want to do it. So I just press K again to continue talking with him and press return. Now I'm actually going to ask him how he thinks of what he thinks about us. This is actually useful to do occasionally. So if we ask about somebody and it says ask about ourselves, then he says you are a skilled storyteller and also a pleasure to speak with. And we can continue talking with him. What I'm going to do since he thinks we're good I'm going to ask him if he wants to join us on our adventure now he very likely won't and there's a few reasons for this which I'll explain in a minute here we go ask a listener to join you press return and we want to ask him to join us on our adventures and he says I would rather not now the reason he would rather not is because he's the tavern keeper and he has a job to do so generally speaking any people that you meet that have jobs will respond with this, I would rather not. Occasionally, and I've had this happen before, I, I once asked a tavern keeper to join me and it turned out that he had a very large desire to explore the world and in fact, he decided to join me. So it does occasionally happen that they will that they will quit their jobs and decide to join you. The other problem is, is that 
Nobody knows anything about us, and so there's no reason for them to join us. When you ask them to join me on my adventures, you're actually you're relying on your reputation as a fighter. And again, we don't actually have a reputation as a fighter, so we're not going to get a lot of people to join us that way. If we can find some drunk people, they will probably join us, and that's, that's, that's a strategy you can use. Now what I'm going to do is I'm going to look on the map. I press Q to get to this map, by the way, again. You can see here that Fern's Tapers is a hillox. Now, hillocks have something called drinking mounds in them, usually, and there are drunks in the drinking mound. Now, it's very unusual because this is this is kind of one of the things that frustrates me again about the game. It's just not done, essentially. But the taverns has alcohol, but no drunks. And the drinking mounds have drunks, but no alcohol. So it's very strange. So the first thing we, I think the first thing that we're actually going to do is that we're going to make our way again to Furnace Tapered, which is a little bit uh, different than what we had originally planned. But I want to go to Furnace Tapered because I think I can get some drunks to join us and that will make our journey a lot more safe. Let's start on our journey. So let's get on our way. I just stand here for a minute. You see those little blue colons? What that means is it's raining. Oh, I just noticed that there's down in the bottom left, if I look, sorry, bottom right, there's a guy standing here and he is a human crossbowman. Humans are yous. You'll, you'll have noticed when we looked at the human bard, he was a pink you. This is a human crossbowman. You know he's crossbowman because he's green. And he's also has this little umlaut over the U, which means he is some kind of military person. So the green plus the umlaut means crossbowman, or or bowman actually for humans as well. We could actually just quickly see if he's interested in going on a journey with us. I'm just going to give him a shout. So I'm just going over here and I'm going to talk to the broad nose human, say hello, and he says. Hello Dwarf, I'm Eret Tempest Clutch. I'm just going to go quickly to the point. Uh, one thing I should also point out here is, because this is actually a rather important point, which I haven't pointed out to this point, you'll notice how his glyph has, is now flashing with a 1. You'll see here, this is the 1. So this is, if you get a lot of people talking at once, this is how you tell which person is talking. So he's number 1, and this is the conversation for number one. So I press K again, ongoing conversation with him. I'm going to just see if he wants to join us. He probably won't, but if he does, that would be great. So. Ah, look at that. I'm, I'm extremely happy because now we have a companion. So things will be much, much easier with a companion. If you press C for companions, you will see now we get access to a companion menu and if we press A we get back to our own uh, screen again I'll press escape to get out of that and if I press B we can look at Arit I'm not sure how to pronounce that <laughs> but you'll see as well that uh, she's she is a, a human crossbow woman she is to the southeast this is crucial your companions will often run off attacking things and Finding them again is extremely difficult. So this screen is incredibly important. You press C to get to your companion list and it'll tell you where they are, which is really, really useful. Now I press B again to get some information and we can see what she has. So she's got a bronze crossbow, large horse leather dress, sheep wool robe, alpaca leather armor. She has a wool quiver. I'm going to press enter to view the quiver oh yes yeah, so she's got 31 bolts in the in the quiver so that's good all right she has cow leather loincloth i'm happy to know that she has cuttlefish leather trousers she has basking shark leggings copper cap yeah we need it we need a helmet actually i i just forgotten about that hopefully we'll be able to pick one up along the way she has llama wool i don't know how to pronounce this shows I suppose I guess it's a it's a French word. There's a leather high boot, and yeah, so she's got a cloak and a headscarf. Let's have a look at her description as well. If we press D for description, so she, her hair is extremely long. All humans have extremely long hair for some reason. 
She ha her extremely short nose is broad. Her eyelashes are quite long. Her ears have small lobes. Her hair is buff. I don't know what buff is. I think it's probably some kind of blondish color. Her skin is pale pink and her eyes are dark taupe. She's kind of anime then, isn't she? She's got pink pink skin and taupe eyes. And we can customize her. I think we will customize her. So actually again, if you want to come up with a nickname for Eret Artukero, then please leave a comment. And for profession name, she is going to be, I'm not sure what her profession is, but for now she'll just be profession companion. I may change that later. So now we have a two. So the other thing you'll notice is her glyph has changed now to an at sign. So now she'll she'll follow along with this. I'm just going to move closer to her so that we can move a little bit more easily. So she'll follow along with this. I may actually just quickly ask her. I'm just going to ask her about her family, just to be polite. So she has a cousin named Leng Dorgolf, and Leng settled in Sun Teaches. Where the heck is Sun Teaches? I wonder. Do we know? I press Q again, and then I go to Sites, and I go F for Filter, and I go Sun Teaches, yes, we do know where it is, and I'll just Z to Center on Selected. Oh, wow, that's really far away. So I wonder if she's actually from that area. I, I forget which area that is. Um, and in fact, we can look it up in, again, the Sites. Sites of population, and if I just search for Sun Teaches, I think I have to use capital S. That's good enough. So Sun Teaches is a hamlet, and it is in the Confederacy Confederacy of Crystal. So I'm guessing that she is from the Confederacy of Crystal. So very interesting. I'll ask a little bit more. If you just go minus here, you can go backwards through the through the menu and that's quite useful at times so i'm going to just keep asking about her family my maternal grandmother was rosmic play inks in 88 rosmic married oxal image shoots uh, i have an aunt named jasmic field shovel so i have a cousin named cop nut metal worm midstream the giant wolf knowing spoken the dangerous dell devoured cop nut in spiral skulks so she's got quite a few interesting stories but i think we'll just uh, carry on. <laughs> we'll maybe ask ask more later. Now that we've moved a reasonable distance away from the fortress, we can actually use what's called fast travel mode. But I just noticed ahead that there are some mountains. Again, if you remember, these are ramps. These little triangles are ramps. And so I'm just going to show you navigating some of these ramps just because it's useful to know. Here you can see this circle where it's where it's all red and green. And if I actually look using L again, it will tell us what we can see. And you can see that this is silty clay loam and pebbles and whatnot. You also see as well here when I went here, so you can we can actually see uh, tracks of us or our companions. Now, one of the things that we can do if we want to, I'm gonna press escape here again. If I press capital T, I believe. If I press lowercase t, that's right, I remember now. If you press K, no, capital K, there we go, capital K, <laughs> then you get, then you get the track. And so those are tracks, and if we actually look at them, it tells you what tracks they are. And so if we're actually tracking someone, that can be quite useful. It can be kind of a pain to use if you are not using it. I'm gonna turn off tracking just for the moment. The thing that you should always do when you're walking is that you should actually sneak. And there's actually a reason for that. Now, if I press capital S, you, this is the same menu we had before that allowed us to run, but we can actually sneak. And if I press S, it says currently sneaking. You can see here, currently sneaking. It also says that our visual stealth is awful. Um, and it tells you the visual stealth factors. So it's light out at the moment, so it's daytime. It's, we have some rain, so that helps us. Um, we're in an open area, which doesn't help us. There is no suitable vegetation to hide against, and uh, we're not in a prone position, we're standing up. So this means that we have awful stealth. 
but it's still useful to have stealth because what stealth does is it will make it easier to see other creatures and hopefully if we run into another creature we'll actually see that so here you can see here it's all black what that means is we have an up ramp here and this is all black so what that means is that the next level up i can't see i can see everything on this level because this is the same level as me but if I go up, I can't see it. So once I go up, if I just move forward one more step, you'll see I'm now on the next level. And these are, if you remember, are my little small up arrows, which tells me that there is a slope below. Now, when you play the game, you won't have the same font as me. When you play the game right out of the box, you'll find that these will be down arrows and I think probably a lot of people are used to the down arrows and because they think of it in terms of a downward slope and although this game if we look you'll see in fact that that the game says that it's a downward slope it is not a downward slope there are no downward slopes in the mechanics of the game although the UI tells you that it's a downward slope it is in fact open space and there is an upward slope below it and that is actually this actually has gameplay implications uh, which is why it's important to remember that this is not a downward slope. So, but you'll see I'm standing on this kind of little ledge here, and there's more mountains above. We're in a mountainous area, so if I just keep moving up, then you can see I keep moving up this thing. Now, I've gone actually down again, so here if I go backwards again, you can see if I move, if I move too forward, I'm actually going to move down into that little pit and then I come back up again. So it's a little bit disconcerting when you're moving and you're going up and down and up and down and up and down. The other thing I should probably point out here, you might be wondering what this is. This is amethyst cluster, so there are gems in there, but we can't mine in adventure mode. It would be nice because we could make some money and we could trade for some beer, but that's the way it goes. So I'm just going to wander along and I'm hoping because we, you'll see in the bottom here, we're in the Beak of Sorcery. So I remember there's some beasts in the Beak, Beast of Sorcery. So you should be able to find some, some creatures. You'll also see again, these inverted highlights. So this is an ampersand with inversion. What that means is that I saw a person, in this case, it's our companion, whose name I forget, let me just press C, it's Arat. And we've seen Arat at this location before, but because it's a mountain in a way, we can't see this anymore. I didn't really explain that so well in the last episode, but in this episode, hopefully it will make more sense. So if we look in the past like this, then you can see these little highlighted things, these pink highlighted things. And that just tells you that there was someone there, um, whether there's someone there now or not is in doubt. I would just keep wandering along and I want to generally make it make my way I generally want to make my way southwest you'll see that every once in a while it pauses like this and that's because it's updating some game information for some reason when I first played this game I never noticed it aha now what you see here you can see this red kind of cone here and this brown cone here and this red cone here now these are sight lines for creatures and that only happens when you're sneaking so if i go capital s again i press s to turn off sneaking you'll see that those cones disappear if i turn on sneaking those cones come back on again so that's why why it's useful to have sneaking on now at the moment you'll also see that on the right hand side that i am i have this a it says i have my armor is a pig shell dress which is not great armor uh, but i'm I have a weapon which is my copper battle axe. Now if I press I, in my right hand I've got my uh, copper battle axe, in my left hand I have a bronze shield. Now we may not be able to do anything about this, but what I'm going to do is these creatures here, if I look at them, these are almost certainly key, keys or kias, I, I'm not sure how you pronounce them actually, they're these colorful green birds. And in, in fortress mode, they are really, really annoying because they steal your stuff and they, they can they can carry surprisingly heavy things, but they, they pester you and they are 
absolute pests. So, while I said we weren't going to kill any, anything, I think maybe we'll take this opportunity to see, and there's quite a lot of them too. We'll see if we can't sneak up on one of these keys and have an interesting battle. Well, this episode's getting a little bit long, so I've decided to actually split it into two pieces. There's nothing like having a cliffhanger after all. I hope you've enjoyed today's episode, and I hope you'll look forward to the next one. This has been Uru Uru Niwa. My name is Mike Charlton. I'll see you next time. Thank you.